I'm going to wait for people to join in before I start. I can always see people joining in. Hey friends, I'm so, yeah. All right, hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Bhandapani, I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And today we have Adam Reed, who is the director of external affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery, and currently the president of CIWM, who's moderating today's webinars. I am sure you would have seen his other webinars. If not, please go to the video panel section of our website and you will find them there. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is innovating our way out of the global waste crisis. We have Daniela Russo, who's the CEO and founder at Think Beyond Plastic, and Tracy Sutton, who's a founder and lead expert at Root. We were supposed to be joined by another panelist, Paula, who couldn't come in because of personal reasons. And uh, so, yes, we will get started soon. Just a reminder to all of you that please use the Q&A section for your questions. Use the chat if you would like to add comments or share something or introduce yourselves. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Sweta. It's good to be here. It's good to be back. It's been a while, hasn't it? How are you, are you keeping well? Sweta, are you keeping well? Yes, yeah, good. absolutely. Keeping perfect. Give me a thumbs up. Thank you. We are, we are live and we are in the room. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Adam Reed. I am the External Affairs Director at Suez. I am the current president of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. But more importantly, I am your chair for the next 59 minutes. So my job is to keep everything flowing, is to make sure these two lovely ladies answer all your questions. Yeah, technical, policy, innovation, it doesn't matter. Get them in. We're going to talk some we're going to talk system design. We're going to talk packaging innovation. We're going to talk material substitution. But more importantly, we're going to talk global waste crisis. Now, if you're on the wrong webinar, don't leave because global waste crisis should be important to all of you, not just those of you that think it's important, because let's be honest, we're all consumers, aren't we? So we're all making difficult decisions, whether you know it or not, when you're in the supermarket, when you're going out with the kids, when you're out of the weekend, should I go out for dinner tonight? Which restaurant should I use? So many decisions that you're making as a consumer, as unfortunately a waste producer. But more importantly, how do you sit alongside brands that are producing more stuff than we need? Overpackaged goods. Is the waste management system really satisfying your demands? Can we recycle our way out of the global waste crisis? Hopefully, we're going to find some of those answers in the next 57 minutes now. So, uh, any questions, drop them in. My job's to field them and make sure that we get as many answers as we can. So let's hand the floor over. Tracy, it's good to see you, Tracy. How are you keeping? Yeah, pretty good, Adam. Very good. All the better for seeing these smiley faces well, this I'm, afternoon or I'm this morning. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, uh, some, of your, uh, some of your perspectives. I, I know you can be a bit provocative. You're going to challenge the norm and you're going to set us up nicely for where, where do we need to go on this, this global waste crisis? Or is it a global resource opportunity? Ah, well, yeah. So, and just a bit of context. So, uh, Root, we're one of you, Europe's leading sustainable packaging consultancies. So, we develop packaging strategy and environmental analysis. So, generally, we work with big brands, uh, but we also do sustainability strategy for packaging producers as well. Um, to set the scene, our strapline is helping brands do more with less. And I say that and I reiterate that because for me, the key way to solve the waste crisis or so one of the key things for us is to design waste out it sounds really simple um i think for us a lot of the world's biggest brands have established that no innovation in single use packaging is actually going to help them reduce their carbon footprint sufficiently enough so that they can meet uh, whatever their carbon targets might be uh, they've really a lot of them have identified that the key to to doing that is to use less um, so to deliver the product to the, to the customer is what we were talking about earlier on this session about a product delivery system. So reuse, return, refill solutions. Um, the problem, I think, for me is that we're not quite ready for reuse, refill. We know it's the, the, the way we need to go. You know, policymakers have only just really started to, to penalise single use. And really, we focused on plastic. Um, I think over time, I'm really hoping that this is going to be um, applying to all materials, so single use in general, because I think that's what, what's one of the big challenges. I think policymakers also need to really incentivise reuse. Um, what we've done previously or up till now really is chosen to incentivise the use of recycled content that might be from some, something that's single use and then that recycled content is going to go back into something that's single use. So we're really focusing on the wrong on the wrong area. Um, plastic sacks is, is a really great example of that. Uh, I think also 
we have got the opportunity to make recyclability um, policymakers rather have chosen to make recyclability quite a big driver of extended producer responsibility and actually that doesn't really connect up with carbon um, and we're not really addressing the the, the, the issue of single use um, I think as a whole I think it's key to say that from my perspective there's not really much regulatory consequence of our throwaway society at a personal or a, a corporate level um, and therefore we haven't really got too much of an incentive to change our behavior Reuse for us uh, really needs new systems to collect and clean. Uh, it needs new materials that ideally show less signs of wear. Um, but they also need to impress and appeal more. It reuse really needs to be convenient, comfortable and very appealing. I think it's worth reflecting back, it, looking at uh, some of the challenges from the 80s, where some of the, our adventures into the refill revolution uh, or, or kind of eco product revolution at the time le left people feeling quite unsatisfied. And I think it's really important to recognize that because we don't want to have compromises. We want to have systems and solutions that people really want to buy into. Um, uh, we also, we've got challenges where some people are less comfortable taking the adventure into, into reusable or refillable packaging, for example. Um, but they've got questions and concerns around hygiene. And on the flip side, we've got hundreds of thousands of people dying every year in parts of the world because of poorly managed waste created from disposable systems. So just kind of bringing it back. Um, I think one of the key questions for me is, you know, why are we investing large amounts of cash in solutions and systems that have got the objective of turning hard to recycle disposable things like multi-material flexible plastic, contaminated waste into then items that can still be recycled. So again, the focus is on getting the waste a bit cleaner, a bit better. Um, and I think it's more about investing time in, or investing more in gaining skills, upskilling designers, producers and engineers to design waste out. So I'm going to leave with this little this little pitch, which is wanting everybody to uh, share a vision, because I don't think we ha have, have enough vision for, for what the future could look like. So a future where policy defines unnecessary single use across key materials or key sectors. A future where governments will map out uh, quite clear proactive strategies to prioritise using less resources. Uh, where reuse and refill thrive in parallel to the decline of today's existing wasteful systems um, and sectors that, you know, the crux of it, some of them won't survive. Um, and I think also where we, we've got a future where we've got numerous really well performing, commercialised at scale, wonderfully performing collection, cleaning, refilling industries. Um, and I think ultimately uh, a future where single use packaging producers, there's a huge gap here, recognise the commercial opportunity and shifting part of their business into more durable goods and services. There's a huge gap that we that we really just don't have the solutions to. That's my little manifesto. Wow. Big picture time. I love that. Setting the I, scene. Well, clearly. And, you know, there's nothing like a vision to get us on the right page, is there? So, so thank you, Tracy. I mean, and, and I mean, I get a lot of that. And, you know, I'm, look, I'm a waste manager. I'm a resource manager by heart. You know, so I'm interested in where these materials end up going. But ultimately, I'm an environmentalist. You know, that I've got a geography degree and a PhD that says, I, you know, I get science. And, and I think a world without waste or a world with less waste and a world with more resources going around and around and around just makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But, mm. but for all the debates we're having in the UK or the European Union even, I mean, does any of that that you've just talked about resonate in Africa or Asia? Are, are they even in the same space as these kinds of discussions? Because I worry that, you know, they haven't even got fundamental collection systems on a daily, weekly basis. You, you want to completely revolutionize their model. Is Maybe it will work better there. Maybe, maybe that's the point. They've not been indoctrinated in the system that's all about recycling. I think I think my thoughts on that is that geographically there are some areas where, where reuse and refill are so much better set up where they don't have the clunky um, huge element or huge uh, uh, investments in infrastructure that we're lumbered with you know organizations have got filling lines production sites distribution chains that are all around dispose, disposable and single use and I think if we're if we're in parts of the world where we don't where we don't have that yet there are really great opportunities for uh, geographies or countries to, to leapfrog some of those but it's it's absolutely key to recognize that um, that the, the geographically there are very very different solutions so if a global brand's got a refill strategy it needs to, to needs to roll out across the uk a couple of couple of countries in europe that's going to look very very different and have very different yeah. priorities where it could be um uh yeah very different okay i appreciate it thank you 
Well, let's invite Daniela to join, and then I can get you two sparring off one another. Daniela Russo, how are you? Uh, you're not in the UK with me at the moment. Where are you? I'm your token American in the conversation, so I love uh, two British accents sparring in a conversation about alternatives. I'm going to add uh, a little bit of an American role with this. I'm calling from California, and uh, <clears throat> let's see, where do we start? Tracy actually uh, came to a very important point, I think, that talked about alternatives. If we want to uh, innovate ourselves out of this mess, we need viable alternatives, commercially available alternatives, packaging, product delivery systems. In other words, we need innovation. So that is what my organization is working on. Um, Think Beyond is an innovation center that focuses on scaling up innovations, addressing specifically the sustainable development goals. And waste is one of our top priorities. In addition, we work on agriculture climate, ocean, energy. And uh, when it comes to waste, our longest project has been on plastics. And with regards to plastics, we specifically develop um, uh, and scale innovation around new materials, uh, new business models, or you know, new ways of delivering product with alternative packaging or with no packaging whatsoever, and green and sustainable chemistry. And um, each year, we, we choose innovations that have commercial viability. Uh, we bring in industry mentorship to them, and we identify appropriate financing. And for, for us, this is really the key to the solution and the key to getting out of a current linear model. It's not just policy initiative. Policy, policy is very important when alternatives exist. But how do we identify this innovation? How do we support it? How do we actually connect it with industry where we find what industry's needs are and gaps are, and we fulfill these gaps? And how do we create the incentives for corporations to um, innovate? Innovation is expensive. So many uh, massive investments have been made in the current infrastructure, including recycling infrastructure, but also manufacturing. So how do you um, get a corporation to change that behavior and what is the proverbial carrot in the stick? You know, the, the stick has been there for a long time. <laughs> it's the consumer uh, reaction to certain types of packaging, to the waste that's being found. But how do we make it easier for corporations who ultimately are beholden to their shareholders to bring in this innovation, to incur the cost, and to move a little faster because they're not moving fast enough for all of the commitments um, Pew Charitable Trust had a report that, that came out, I think, about two years ago that showed that all the cor cor current corporate commitments to reduce their plastic waste don't add up too much by comparison with the explosion of consumption and production. So how do you, how do you create an environment where um, those who make the packaging decisions actually make them with the consumer in mind, with the uh, externalities in mind? and not just economic decisions. So um, let me just stop here and move on to, to the conversation. Well, thank you, uh, Daniela. Some, some, some big hitting items there as well. Uh, and hopefully the audience are, uh, are starting to think hard about how they're gonna stretch you to. Um, so, I mean, you, you talked a lot about innovation. I'm quite interested in materials innovation. Um, and I think, you know, in Europe, we've seen a lot of material innovation or substitution possibly because of uh worries about plastic plastic tax carbon tax you know there's a list of kind of things that are happening around europe and so we've seen we've seen businesses that are moving into um biodegradable compostable type packaging i mean what's your what's your thought about that as a as a, as a step forward daniela let, let me just make um something clear there are many innovation opportunities along the circle of a circular economy multiple and what we're seeing is that in the post-consumer phase, there is no lack of innovation and appropriate financing. The Alliance to End Plastic Waste has a billion dollars to deploy towards end of pipeline innovation, recycling, uh, waste to energy, waste to fuel, and so on and so forth. Um, it's easy because it supports the current business model, and to a, to a certain extent, it creates the, con the kind of conditions, the thinking that we can continue to manufacture and consume in the current way, and there is a way out just by innovating on the back end, which is not really true. 
um, our focus has been in preventing the waste from taking place in the first place by introducing these new materials as we speak and new product delivery systems and green chemistry uh, that incorporates into, into the packaging decisions. And so the big challenge there, of course, is that there is not a material that is as cheap as plastic or as versatile as plastic right now. That is a given. So if we're always looking for this substitution one-to-one, -one, figuring out what this next magical material is that will replace plastic, we won't find it. The substitutions need to happen along the line of um, the decision whether plastic or not is the most appropriate material for certain packaging decisions. Where is it a must? The European Union has done fairly well in uh, actually analyzing the use of plastic and saying, where is it a desirable substitution? Where is it a requirement? And when plastic is used, what kind of plastic is being used? But there are, there are many applications and we have many startups working in Europe right now who are using agricultural waste or who are using um, algal biomass or alginate or um, chitin, if you will, or uh, casein, which is a byproduct of the dairy product, uh, dairy industry to create these new materials that are what we call bio benign. They are generated through a sustainable source. They have a sustainable end of life. They break down if they end up in the environment. And then the gray area of the uh, compostables. I know there's been a lot of interest in, in, the, pub, in the audience from what to do with compostables. Um, the, the great challenge with all of these materials is how they're being used. If we end up overusing one material the way we're overusing plastic right now, we'll end up in a different kind of mess. So that's not the point. The point is to make sustainable packaging decisions as Tracy's organization is doing and what she was talking about and figuring out what is the right material for the right application. And we're kind of lazily assuming that plastic will do it all because it's so darn cheap and it's so versatile and you can do anything with it. But now we're at a point where we need to reconsider these packaging decisions and say, is that really true? Is that necessary? Is over packaging necessary? Or do we have other ways of delivering this product? And by the way, for me, refill and reuse is kind of boring because it's your grandparents model. And if anybody tells me one more time how they used to get yogurt in a big bowl and just go to the dairy and go home and bring it, this is old news. We live in a, we live in a busy society. We like the disposable model because it's convenient and it suits our lifestyle. The question is, if we do produce products in a disposable packaging, what is this packaging made of? Where does it go? How do we, how do we manage its end of life? And it's not just by putting a recycling bin on every beach because that clearly is not enough. Thank so you. Um, these are the decisions I think we need to make. You've opened a can of worms for me here. So let, let me- let me. You let want me... me to shut up, I no, will. No, okay. no, it's fine. I, I've, I've got a few things here. So I, do, you, do you think we can't change consumer behavior so that we don't- Oh, I do not think so. We change consumer behavior all the time. Okay. Fashion changes our behavior every season and forces us to spend thousands of dollars buying new clothes that get all after a season. So consumer behavior can be changed. The question is, when disposable came into our lives, it was not just a function of a consumer preference, it was a function of a lifestyle. It was suitable to our lifestyle. So now we're looking into, you were just using a reusable bottle when you were drinking. There, there are certain ways in which reusable is coming into our lives. There you go. Yeah, I hope it's glass and not plastic. Um, that are, that are, that are good and that are important. But I also think we can't just look backwards for examples that work. I think we need to look forward and say, how do we incorporate this? So I absolutely do believe we can change behavior. We already have a lot of, uh, you know, that, that has affected behavior in the global North. But I also don't think that we can only count on changing behavior uh, when there are no alternatives. To change behavior, you need viable alternatives. And if you put on the shelves in, um, in a country in the global south, you know, a glass bottle that is five times more expensive than a plastic bottle, how are you supporting that behavior change? You're not. 
no, fair point. Well, mate, um, try, uh, Tracy, I'm sure you've got some, some opinions to share on this. I mean, I am sitting here. It is plastic, I'm sorry, but it has been used thousands of times. I can, I can definitely uh, own up to that. That's not a good thing. Well, you know, it is what it is. I'm sorry. Um, but, um, but normally I would sit here with a China cup and I'd be drinking tea most people that know me. So, you know, so I, I think I can tick that box. But I think the issue for me is, and I'm going to bring you in, Tracy, I, I'm looking at, you know, these types of example, and I'm looking at people taking mugs, you know, metal coffee mugs that they use, you know, endlessly on their journeys. And yet I'm still in the minority on the train in the morning going mm, into London. Yeah, and there's still are. people walking along the street with their coffee cups, throwing them everywhere and covering themselves in unwanted, you know, latte. Why is it that, you know, that's why I asked the question about can we change consumer behavior? Because somehow we've got to slow everybody down a bit and go, you don't need to drink whilst you're walking to the office. Mm. Now you're making a judgment call. I'm sorry, Tracy, I'll let you ask. No, you no, no. Go for I, don't it. Think, I don't think we should make judgment calls about who should drink or uh, do what. Um, but but, I, but I could just take away the option of the disposable, couldn't I? I could literally say you can't have a coffee from Starbucks or Costa unless it's in a refillable mug. I mean, there are option, you know, quality control here. I, I'm not stopping somebody drinking. I'm just saying maybe you stop them using a disposable cup. Tracy, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, Tracy, I mean, you, could, you know, I'm not going to make any friends here, but you can imagine there being a policy whereby if, if certain single use items were considered unnecessary, where there was a viable, reusable one that was affordable and accessible. And that's really important. Um, so, yeah, that there's lots of areas. I think one of the one of the things for me that's 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 quite important is, um, you know, like for us, you know, every every material has got a place, you know, whether we are drilling oil, using the materials that use glass, mining metals out the ground. Like for us, you know, we are not, we do not do plastic free. It's not about that. It's about really understanding out of an entire portfolio, what is most suited, what's, what's most suitable for single use, what's most suitable for reuse. If you think about medical device sector, it's very, very different. You've got some items that are literally saving lives and plastics in the many instances are in some, you know, commercially, environmentally different, different reasons are the best solution. So I think it's really important. That's why we do strategy because it really prevents those knee-jerk reactions. And I think that we're, I hear, I hear the need for us to, to do innovation. For me, that innovation has got to be within a real clear environmental and social framework. So every single material, the more we farm things, the more we fish things, the vegans aren't gonna be happy with things that, are, that come from, from, from animal products. We start needing to think about farmer livelihoods. We start needing to think about people who are growing crops, the, the soil impacts and the water impacts of a lot of things we've looked at in, in our impact analysis. They're huge compared to plastic. So, you know, without wanting to make this, you know, an even more complicated topic, I think the key thing for me is that we need to be quite calm and collected about how we're how we're choosing these materials and recognizing that some things just have to be single use. You know, it's about making them making them as good as they can be. And for those reusable items, let's be using the materials that are so durable and that wear really well. In some instances, we've been using for decades. You know, yeah, um, I agree. I've still got Tupperware dishes from my yes. mum that date back to the 1970s in my cupboard. Love a bit of Tupperware. And I still yeah. use them, but other brands are available. Um, look, yeah. we've got some great questions coming in from the audience. So let's, let's pitch one. All of this talk about reducing packaging, Daniela, suggests that we need to have more local economies. If things have got to get local, we're not going to move stuff so much. I mean, is that viable? Well, um, it depends. So North America is very different from Europe, very different from Africa and South America in terms of their supply chains. So in North America, you probably have heard we have this big problems with the uh, uh, baby formula right now. And it's only because 95% of the baby formula in, the, in North America is manufactured by one company. That's not the case in Europe. So resilient local uh, supply chains exist in Europe, and this is all more likely to take place when the, you know, the ecosystem allows for this regional aspect and delivery of uh, individually, um, individual decisions on packaging. In North America, it's more difficult. Um, and, I, and I don't want to say more about that uh, because the decisions are made on a corporate level globally and more in a different way. It's all about, you know, um, monetizing and profits. Um, 
whether it is possible, not only is it possible, I think resilient local supply chains is a big thing, especially in the aftermath of COVID. I think we see it happening. We see it, we have innovators in Indonesia, we have innovators in the Philippines, and they're all developing local solutions, oftentimes um, with um, local materials and with uh, kind of participating in local supply chains. I personally would love to see this grow. We're supporting this through our innovation center in Germany and another one that we're building in Southeast Asia. And I think it will be the, the future, uh, more resilient local uh, decisions right. and ecosystems. Right. Yes. I, li I like that, that's, that's strong messaging and I completely agree. So a, a, a follow on thought around this, compost, organic waste going back into nutrient value or soil structure improvement yeah. that to me has to be you know one of the really obvious local closed loop solutions to what is still a big waste problem no matter which country you're in anywhere in the world but tracy why is it we don't get organic waste management right because for some reason we don't value it in the way that we value an aluminium tin for example mm. and yet the value in the soil to grow the stuff we need to eat just seems to be like basic GCSE geography and yet it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen no. enough. Well it doesn't and also we've got we've got a lot we've got this real tension between organizations that produce compostable pr products and that suggests that they can be collected in different waste streams. Um, and those people who work in those waste streams who do not want those materials in those waste streams and evidence to suggest that actually there's no organic soil health benefit from that compostable material going back into the soil. You know, are we then messing with, bio, with, with, with biodiversity or soil or, um, or soil health if we're putting things that used to be from uh, from from sea and water and marine and into soil health? As, you know, so we've got some real big things that we need to factor on. And also there are some. There are some interesting things going on in the sector whereby decisions are being made to accept compostable materials into the organic waste. So if you've, you've got things like coffee, coffee pods, tea bags, coffee bags, and it's, and, it's, and it's an accepted thing for us to do that. And yet in most instances, they're still going to be extracted. <laughs> um, you know, they want the coffee. They want the organic stuff. They don't want the compostable plastics at all. And, and, and what, what interests me about, say, the coffee pods, for example, is what nutrient value do they create? the answer is negligible if not nothing so actually as a, as an as a farmer the last thing i want is to see food waste mixed with a load of other stuff that doesn't enhance my soil at all that's never going to become an end an end market for me so the, yeah the, the value to him he's he, he wants really valuable rich nutrient rich soil that's going to be degraded if you then start accepting um compostable plastics so, arguably Okay, I'm going to bounce around because there's some great questions coming in. Like the, the audience have just woken up. Somebody said something provocative and off we've gone. So um, incentives to in innovate. Come back to you, Daniela. Um, instead of focusing on increased economic output and consumption, you know, how do we, how do we drive innovation uh, you know, with positive social environmental outcomes? What's, what's the trigger for, for, for industry particularly, I think, to innovate, well, unless it's about I, economics. I need to tell you this. Um, I've been in this business for about 10 years. And before that, I was in Silicon Valley and spent my entire life in high tech, um, starting businesses, running businesses. And the generation of innovators I'm seeing right now is incredibly different from my experience in Silicon Valley and you know the first half of my life. Um, the generation of innovators think about sustainability, think about the planet. They're absolutely motivated by the right goals. And it's not just financial returns. You know, nobody is looking just for the next unicorn. And frankly, there are no unicorns in material development. <laughs> so I think that um, supporting this kind of innovation is essential because it, the, the innovator's journey is long and oftentimes disheartening. It's difficult to get financing for this. In Europe, it's particularly difficult because European markets and investors are very risk averse. So there is more um, institutional capital in Europe. In North America, the risk taking is there, but nobody's interested in materials unless they're very cool and very sexy, like mycelium, like vegan leather, things like that. But my bottom line is, um, 
the universities are producing a crop of innovators who are really seriously looking into the future um, from things like CO2 capture and reduction to, like I said, the new materials, innovations in energy. And I think this is the right thing to do. And we're excited about this. And this is why we've created our innovation center to uh, specifically identify and, and focus and scale up that kind of innovation. So how do we support it? We support it by uh, being able to find the right sort of financing. This is the role of government and policy to create in, in, you know, instruments to support and invest in this kind of innovation, to risk it, make it a little cheaper, allow lab space and uh, access to pilot sites. And again, this is one of the areas in which we put in a lot of effort. Thank you. And you're right. There's, 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 there's a need for a lot of collaboration. And Tracy and I, you know, we work together on lots of things and with, with the value chain. And actually, it's when you get yeah. the value chain coming together going, we've got a problem, but we can also find a way out of this that I think you start to get real traction. Listen, a couple of really interesting comments come in. Um, yesterday was World Biodiversity Day. So well done, well, well, well done, everybody. The conversation is red hot. Thank you for that. Um, another comment, composting. Is it waste disposal or is it to produce a valuable product. Tracy, what do you reckon? Mm. Or what should it be? I need to pause on this one. Should it be waste reduction? I mean, we talk about organic recycling and mechanical recycling. So if we're doing an assessment on recyclability, we look at whether or not something, all the different things that, 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 that drive recyclability of a mechanically recyclable component, glass, metal, paper, yeah. Um, or plastics but then if we're looking at organic recycling it's it's the systems in place and the likelihood and all those different things that enable or can, that would consider something to be compostable in practice um phrase that for me again adam the question is it is it waste recycling is it, it, so the, well the question was more around is it about producing a product or is it about managing waste i've paraphrased it for you because I think, I think the question is interesting. In the UK, composting is a way of reducing the amount of organic waste that ends mm -hmm. up in an end point, which will be landfill or, or EFW. Mm -hmm. I don't think we use composting in the UK to generate a valuable product. No. I recycling, okay, yeah, okay. recycling, I think, has evolved in recent years to the point where we, our focus, my MRF, is all about producing end quality that the market will buy. Mm-hmm. I don't think we do that with organics. I know, and maybe, no, maybe we're odd or, should, and or if, we should change. Oh, if you think about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you know, that the, one of the whole principles is around keeping those material streams for, you know, as high a quality for as long as possible. And I think we need to, and that kind of goes against the accepting and allowing compostable plastics in, into the organic stream. So, you know, as you say, connecting with biodiversity, soil health, we want really healthy, rich, nutritious soils. Um, we've got enough problems with yeah droughts in different parts of the world and soil degradation dust you know um, we need we, I, I kind of feel like I'm kind of hoping that soil health is going to be the next big thing because I feel like this huge shift the whole like anti-plastic thing which is not necessarily the greatest in the world but is really taking us towards going you know the huge global supply shortage we've got of, of, of trees there's only a certain limited amount of responsibly managed forests um, and so the challenge is, is, OK, we've got monoculture trees, lots of different, the same, same kind of trees planted, degrading the, the, the soils. And I think that in about three to five years times, we're really going to be going, oh, yes, we've got some pretty big problems with, with soil health. Maybe we need to go back into plastics again because we don't have those issues. I think you raise a really valid point. I, th I think, you know, a, a huge global debate about soil health and its impact on human health would probably be a really valuable step change. Right, Daniel, here we go. Um, some really interesting debate coming in now. The audience is really, really getting a bit hot now. So um, is the answer to overconsumption to kill capitalism? That's a bit of a big question. You've, you've got, you know, one line. What do you reckon? I, I don't want to answer that question because I have so many questions that follow on. Here is the deal. I... My personal story is I uh, grew up in a communist country. I defected and arrived in the United States. So I defected from, from communism. Um, I love capitalism until I defected from Silicon Valley and started a sustainability company because capitalism for all of its uh, 
immense opportunities has a lot of downsides, like overexploitation of resources. And so I don't think the problem is the political system. I think the problem is our economic system. Uh, capitalism has nothing to do with our choices to use oil uh, because it's so darn cheap. And recycled material right now is more expensive, even at the current prices of oil, than oil. So the question really is not about political systems, in, in my view. I think the question is into, you don't need to be a communist or a capitalist to have an opinion about the planet. Any smart person, capitalists including, will know that if you overuse resources in the way we do, eventually you run out of resources. And you, you could very easily find foundations for this in, in any uh, book on economics. So it's in our, in our best interest to, you know, uh, think about how we use resources, forget about the political system. No, that's, that's a fair point. And I've got to be honest, I mean, I'm, look, I'm you know, I'm well into my 40s, everybody. I, I grew up reading dystopian science fiction novels from Planet sure. of the Apes to, to, to you know, to, uh, to Soylent Green. The bottom line is all of them talk about the destruction of a planet because there's too many of us consuming resources at too fast a rate. We were writing about it in the 50s and 60s. We're only now waking up to the fact it is reality. It's not science fiction. And I think you're right. It doesn't matter about, you know, the, the political system at all here. The economic system has got to change, but we've just got to wake up as a, as a society. And, and all, you, all you need to do is look at companies with a different political system like China, and they're not a shining example of environmental policies. No, no, um, so. I grew, Like I said, I grew up in a communist country where the environment was destroyed by the communist government. It's not a political decision. No, good it's point. a smart business decision, how you want to do the Thank environmental you. resources. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask a poll question, Sweater. Let's, let's get the audience to, uh, to vote. So let's, let's provoke a bit more discussion. We've, uh, we've prepared a couple of questions for you, audience. So let's try the first one. So here's the first one. So you, you've heard a lot of chat about, you know, where we can influence the system and, you know, which bit needs to change. Is it design, product design, system design? you know, material design? Is it around consumption? You know, we need to do more around the consumption system. We've got a lot of chat about consumption. Is it production? You know, with the oil debate already in the plastic debate. Is it about the, the way that we recover materials? We capture them, we harvest them. Or is it about the reprocessing, putting materials back into secondary and tertiary lives? Which point in our linear, increasingly circular model do we need more national, international, global policy intervention? It's a simple click the one, that makes the most sense to you. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of balance here. Where does the big piece of policy intervention globally have to happen to make this system work better? So take your vote. In the meantime, um, Tracy, um, lots of chat here about, look, we've, we've kind of made smoking unacceptable. Um, we made it more expensive with taxes. We kind of put all of that, that negative messaging on the outside yet people are still smoking. So how are we gonna honestly stop people from consuming the wrong stuff? Someone um, a couple of years ago said to me, just a friend, not in the sector, was like, why don't we just have a convenience tax? I said, what do you mean? They were like, well, you know, if you're, if you, if you're having on the go food, if you just, you know, if, you ha if, you've, got, if you've got the income to be able to, to eat on the go and not have to eat out of Tupperware or whatever your kind of situation is, then why don't we never have a convenience tax? And I quite like that idea, actually. Um, because I, it felt like a good rule of thumb. Again, I'm probably not going to win any friends by, by suggesting this, but um, so uh, it is, and the governments have got to weigh that up in terms of, 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 the, of the incentives and the revenue that they get from tax, tax from yeah. single use. Fair point, stop. fair point. Sweta, have we had enough people responding? Let's see the scores on the doors. Well, wow, have a look at this. So what do we got here? So we've got, so design, 46%, consumption, 14%, production, 24%, recovery, 14%, and just three down at re repression. That's quite, it's quite a mix, isn't it? I'm surprised. I thought it would have been more obvious it was one or the other. What, what do you think, uh, that, Tracy, first? I, I, did, did, does that mirror your thoughts? or? I am so pleased to see design as the top area in terms of policy intervention because i think that um as a sector the design sector is 
absent from pretty much most conversations. Uh, 80%, I say this put me in every single session I have, 80% of a product's impact is defined at the design stage. And yet as a sector and an organisation and involvement in conversations, it is absolutely absent. Um, most of the events that I go to, I ask for a show of hands as to people who are, from, who are you know, a design. You have a moral obligation as far as I'm concerned. If you are designing, producing, profiting from creating stuff, it is absolutely imperative that you are uh, considering the environmental and social impacts um, of, the, of the stuff you're producing. So I'm over the moon to see that uh, and I shall be sharing that on my channels because I think it's a really, really good provocation. Super. And, and Daniela, how, how does it resonate with you? I couldn't agree more. As you know, uh, my bias, of course, is always on design. And um, I would unpack this a little bit to say it's uh, not just the product, it's how it's packaged, it's how it's delivered, it's how it's disposed of. We need policies that uh, create the incentives for doing the right thing and uh, not passing the burden on the innovators, but just kind of uh, getting it out of the mode of uh, produce, use, discard into a circular mode and creating economic incentives to do so. I'm, I'm a great believer in this. I'm glad to see that the audience is uh, responding positively to this as well. Thank you. And when you and I spoke the other, the other day, Daniela, we were talking about um, design and actually we talked a lot about system design didn't we we were you know whether it's new materials coming in or it's you know designed so that you can then have a refill or refurb or repair system uh, built around it often I think we talk in, certainly in, in northern countries western countries when we talk about design we talk about designers we talk about designers and, pa and packaging we talk about designers and products yes. but actually design's a much bigger issue than just a new piece of packaging isn't it yeah Design is, um, to, to us, it means designing uh, the product uh, as a service, like software as a service, product as a service. What if we were able to deliver the product to the consumer at the time of purchase based on their need in the amount that they want, not in a standard amount and packaging that sits on a shelf? And what if you're able to establish this interaction, which is a one-on-one -on -one interaction in an intelligent way so that as a consumer, you receive exactly what you want, but no more and no less. It's no secret that uh, companies deliberately package a certain amount in um, in the prepackaged products such that it never gets squeezed out of the tube, like you know, shampoo and, and uh, toothpaste. What if that's no longer the case? Um, so I think that there are many really exciting opportunities for the future about product delivery systems. We're experimenting some of this with some uh, big brands. And uh, I think we need to leverage the power of blockchain technology, the power of uh, the, uh, the software development to actually enable that delivery and that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the consumer, as opposed to just plunking a cardboard box on a shelf or a plastic box on a shelf that somebody has to get rid of. Um, to me, that is a thing of the past, and I want to look into the future and see how we can do something something better. We did a project with Unilever that I can speak about um, about a year ago, and their particular interest was in finding, uh, for the cosmetics and beauty product division, finding biobenign alternatives to their packaging. And so uh, they wanted um, non-fossil fuel-based products that could have a sustainable lifestyle, and their secondary uh, interest was in paths for carbon capture and reuse through their packaging. Yep. And so that is a company that made a big commitment in Davos two years ago to use less packaging, less plastic, better plastic or no plastic. And they're serious about this. So um, others will follow suit. I think the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has done a phenomenal job with the new plastics economy and the participants in making these commitments. I'd like to see more, and I'd like to see more of them seriously putting money towards incorporating that kind of innovation. That's, that's a great example. And I've got to be honest, we've been working with Unilever for a few years, looking at you know how we can support them on that journey. So it's good to see that we're all on the same page. The yeah. other thing that I think is really interesting about Unilever is they've done a joint um, apprenticeship program with Suez. So their I apprentices didn't know that. That's fantastic. And, and my apprentices get together for 12 weeks and my apprentices learn all about packaging design and 
shelf lives and you know how things are, are are made and not made and and their guys and girls learn from from our guys about what happens post-consumer and what's recyclable and what's not and the idea at the end of it was they created some new packaging for um some co cosmetics in the uk that's going to go on um, on market next year now that's the kind of innovation tracy that we're looking for isn't it that, that chain coming together to go you know what we can do better is it single use is it reuse well ideally it's going to be refill but you know in fair in, in, in so and, and my and I'm only being provocative as you know I am because because I wonder how much if that energy that that work is always needed on a policy level on a design level and that work is always a lot more valuable if we were able to use less yeah um one of the other things I was just going to touch on is is just what Daniela was talking about in terms of the that the system because uh, we, we were talking earlier about I think sometimes when you talk to a packaging producer or if we talk to a pack packaging producer is a lot more of an uncomfortable conversation than it is with the brand which is still a difficult conversation most brands don't want to and aren't ready to make reuse and refill commitments we have to we've got to get there before you know France is happening UK it's around the corner and people just aren't ready it's you know it's, it's a different model it's something that they need to bring in house and it's really quite an alien concept let alone the commercials around it you know consumer researchers we know that quite a lot of people are ready yet because a lot of the systems the systems just just have been, have been a bit clunky so i think the key thing we do like a reuser journey which is you know you've got a single use and a reuse if you look at that whole reuser journey you've got the consumer or the user and then you've got all the different stakeholders that are absolutely crucial to get that product to all the different components all that in that journey and it's we're looking at those different areas of policy and for in, in, uh, intervention for reuse and, and, and refill or whatever those solutions might be. It's really making sure that everybody everybody gets value throughout that chain because if there's no incentive or no value or no commercial benefit, capitalism or not, um, then then things aren't just, they're just going to not going to move. And that can be simple examples of things like hotel refill systems in hotels. You know, yep. you've got you've got the delivery system which is a soda stream delivery system which is a, a dispenser in a, in a in a hotel there's lots of systems that actually work quite well um so it's, it's not necessarily about inventing the wheel but it's about trying to make these experiences a little bit more desirable so that people buy into them rather than thinking they're a bit a little bit naff i think i think you're right there's a sales pitch there isn't there right daniela you've got a point to make right and i just wanted to actually make another point adam um i agree with all of this and dispenser amenities is uh uh, one of the first companies that our institute uh, helped launch almost 10 years ago, and now they're in many, many hotels, dispensing, wouldn't you know it, shampoo and lotion. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is we talk a lot about single-use packaging as the cause for waste, but there are at least two other very substantial damaging uses of plastic, and one of them is uh, plastic sheets uh, for agriculture that's used for agriculture. Mm. Um, as well as plastic packaging in agriculture, for sure. But one that is not so often talked about is plastic sheets that cover the land. And so um, we've done a study on this, and we actually just completed a big project with uh, Driscoll and several big partners of Driscoll. Driscoll is the world's leading uh, producer, uh, shipper, and grower of uh, berries. And you see them in Europe as well. They work with individual farms who grow the fruit for them and then it gets shipped under the brand name Driscoll. And the reality is that plastic in agriculture is used like plastic everywhere else for good purpose. You know, it covers the land, it reduces the evaporation, it um, reduces the use of the need for pesticide and spraying. However, over time and over use, this plastic breaks down into toxic particulate matter and comes into the soil. And some preliminary studies can tell us that it has the potential to destroy the microbial life of the soil. So what do you do? And so we've been working with Driscoll and a number of partners to figure out what alternatives there are for uh, reducing their reliance on this material, uh, probably bringing material from a different biodegradable um, source, as well as um, reducing the use of tenting. And again, you've seen these probably in fields, the tenting that shades delicate fruit from sun Yep. Um, and, um, in, you know, in, in some countries like southern Italy or uh, South America, they're essential because without them, they cannot grow the fruit because it's getting so hot. So that is really important to consider. And the other one, the other sector that produces a lot of plastic waste is fashion. 
And that is really well understood because of the, the threads that are, I'm, I'm not even talking about microfiber and shedding, but the threads that are in, in fashion and in fast fashion and the amount of waste there is simply overwhelming. So when we talk about innovation, we talk about the incorporation of new materials in all of these sectors, not just um, you know plastic and packaging and single use and disposables. These are just as wasteful. Thank you. Yeah, and you're right to open it back up. So many other sectors, so many other interventions. Um, so I've got one more question and then I've got a poll question. So I'll ask you the question first. A couple of the audience have raised this. It's about extended producer responsibility. There's a lot of reform coming, a lot of policy coming into Europe in particular um, around brands, producers being ultimately responsible for the full life cycle cost of the packaging initially, but it will apply to tires and mattresses and other things in the future. Um, yeah. is, is that the step change? I'll start with you, Tracy. Is that the step change? If we get EPR right, do, does that start to drive some of the systemic change that's needed in, you know, whether it's the design of the materials and the packaging or it's the design of the system or it's payment for doing the right thing. Is that, is that going to open up, you know, some real innovation and opportunity or, or doesn't it go far enough? Um, I don't want to be too critical about it because I think it is going to give us some, it <laughs> on a global level, it's really difficult for brands because of the modulations working different in different countries. countries. Uh, yeah. But the overarching principles, you know, will, will will generally be the same in terms of you know the the, the harder to recycle, the, the the higher the fee. That will drive good changes in one direction, but then if people are shifting to materials that are heavier to collect, clean, recycle, glass, metal, fiber higher soil and that's why I say like, like in three or four, three or five years time after the EPR is kind of embedded especially in some of the countries where it is, is is live and modulated and is or in the next few years that's when we'll really start to see the impacts on soil and water and other metrics which we just haven't really thought about so I'd much rather I'd much rather see EPR connected to carbon at a bare minimum okay so you brought carbon back in. What about you, Daniel? I mean, the US has got, you know, uh, extended producer responsibility, pr probably not quite as regimented as it is in Europe and certainly not as, not as you know, all singing, all dancing. But I mean, that, does it drive the right the corporate behaviours? The wild, wild west. It's the wild, <laughs> wild west here. <laughs> it's the wild, wild west. Uh, there is huge battle by many well-intended NGOs to pass uh, EPR laws uh, with regards to plastics. It's really hard. Our plastics lobby is very, very powerful and very well, very wealthy. Uh, but I should say that I'm a great supporter. I think it's the right thing to do. I think companies need to be made responsible for the product they put out. And honestly, part of the big problem with all of these voluntary commitments is there is absolutely no accountability. So they can make any commitment they want, but if they don't meet it, so what? I mean, look at Coca-Cola. They made a commitment 20 years ago that they're going to use 20% recycled material. And then kind of throughout the years, they slowly stopped doing it. Now, all of a sudden, they're announcing things like this again. There is no accountability. So if the EPR uh, mechanism is the way to go, yes, I think that will be the right thing to do. And I agree, by the way, Tracy, with your assessment and in, in the kind of the, the level of... Um, um, um detail you introduce into this but in general i think it's a great mechanism cool right let's have let's have a last final poll question for the audience here we go boys and girls so we're going to try and break the linear economic model we've talked about it a lot you know we've talked about you know changing political regimes we've talked about global economic systems but here we go which one of these, you can only pick one of them, which one of these is most likely, in your opinion, to help break the linear economic model? Is it going to be the right to repair movement that's, that's growing rapidly across Europe? Is it going to be the, the global refill standards so that you know, everything is designed with refill in mind? Is it going to be waste reduction targets, targets to reduce waste? Is it going to be resource consumption targets, targets that limit what we can consume? Or is it going to be something like a personal carbon target? where you get to decide whether you're vegan or you drive a gas guzzler or you fly on holiday. You, you balance, and that could work at a corporate level as much as, as you as an individual. Take your pick, 
Pick the one you like most. Pick the one you think is going to be the one that's going to game change for us. I know it's a difficult question. I know it's all of the above, but I didn't give you that option. So apologies. Um, we've got a couple of minutes while people are voting. So um, I'm, I'm just wondering, Tracy, you know, this, we, we started with a really big question, which is, like, you know, how do we how do we move the agenda forward on, you know, the global waste crisis? Where is the opportunity, you know, in terms of global resource management? I mean, if you were going to pick one or two, you know, pockets of, of hope, what would they be? Where would you point people, you know, go and have a look at this. This could be a game changer. I would be asking people to, to invest in, in, in design. I don't think people take design as a skill very seriously um, at all. Uh, you know, we're not talking about the fluffy things that, that sell stuff. We're talking about things to actually make sure that we design using the right materials for the right purposes. Um, there's a huge skills gap. Many conversations have been in left, right and centre around the fact that there's a really huge skills gap that people don't really understand how to design, how to specify. We've got some of these kind of clunky material hierarchies, which can be quite helpful. Um, but I think it's really about helping understand how people how if, if people use less, they've got less risk attached to the hundreds of millions of tons of, of, of stuff that they're producing. So I think it would, would be definitely around um, upskilling internal teams, which is, a, again, a, a global shortage of, of, of people with the right skills, but learning how to design more responsibly and just really to capture uh, responsible sourcing and also, you know, social impacts and environmental impacts. We can't solve any waste crisis if we just think about environmental impact. We've got to think about the people who are involved in these supply chains and collecting this stuff because wow. pe people are dying in that sector every day some, as well. Some good messages in there. I like that. Thank you. Uh, and you're upskilling. You're, you're back onto one of my particular pet topics. So thank you. And Daniela, where would you point people in terms of a direction of travel? What should they be looking for? What are the, the bright young things or bright new things coming over the horizon? Well, you know, the thing about um, waste is that it's a wicked problem. As I, as I said before, there are multiple ways to address this. That's, that's a term from design language. And it really is there to characterize these problems that um, are so hard to address and resolve because they require multiple interventions. Many of them cancel each other. Um, there are many of them conflicting with each other. So wicked problems by nature are tough and never solvable completely. They live in the balance. So the beauty in the solutions is they, the solutions need to complement each other. And so we've focused so much on recycling in the past and the post-consumer activities and, and what happens after the product is used. I do really believe that we need to look into innovating the product delivery cycle, innovating around new materials and incorporating this in a new design for how we interact with materials that are not desirable and fossil fuel plastics are not desirable. So there are great uses for them, but not for everything. So my uh, kind of ray of hope is this increased effort on uh, green sustainable chemistry and on new materials and how they're making more of a place for themselves in our society. Fabulous. Check them out. Right. Sweater, what was the score on the door? What was the answer? Let's have a look. Oh, this is interesting reading now. Here we go. Yeah. So we've got right to repair with 12%, global refill standards, 27%. Waste reduction targets, 21%. Resource consumption targets, 27%. Yes. And personal carbon targets, 12%. Tracy, you got what you wanted. I you did. It's not very often that happens at these at this age. But yeah, no, I'm well, pleased. Again, <laughs> we, 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 need, we need to use less stuff. We've got one planet and quite a lot of people on it. And uh, our consumption habits aren't really changing that much. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how that works in practice. Thank you. I'm really interested as well about the global refill standards. I think, you know, 27% going, going that as their primary. I think that, you know, you, you've done a good job today of pitching sort of refill and the whole, you know, design for, for, for refill system. So well done. Listen, um, you, you two have been fantastic. I mean, I could have sat here for hours, but I've got things to do, so I won't. But um, thank you for your time anyway. Um, uh, audience, you've been awesome. Great questions. I haven't answered them all, but I think we've done a reasonable job. Those that sent them in pr previously, hopefully we've answered a few of those as well. So, you know, you've all got something there. Um, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy myself. I mean, I think my, uh, I always ask for a hashtag takeaway. So, Daniela, have you got a hashtag you want to take away? What's your, it can only be two or three words though. It's got to be a hashtag. Have you got one for me? The time for change and innovation is now. 
Hashtag innovation is now. Tracy, hashtag, what you got? Less is more. Hashtag less is more. And I'm going to have hashtag innovate. Done. Sweater, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'll hand you back. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Daniela. And thank you, Tracy. Thanks a lot to the audience. Uh, you've been very active today, so which is great. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, this uh, webinar is being recorded. It will be up on our website and on YouTube in two weeks' time. But since you uh, registered for it, you will have access to it on Zoom. So bye, everyone. Have a good day, good afternoon, good evening. Bye -bye. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.